Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Good morning. I'm going to open up in prayer. I'd like to welcome everyone in the name of Jesus. I'd like to welcome everyone online. Father, we just praise you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Lord, we thank you for this day, Lord God. We ask you to bless it, Lord God. We thank you, Father God, that we have the anointing within, Father God, to hear the word, to do the word, to preach the word in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We thank you for that anointing, Lord God. We thank you for this day, Lord God. Lord, we thank you, Father God, whether here or online, Father God, people's lives are going to be touched, changed, Lord God, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Lord, we thank you, Father God. We thank you, Father God, for responses from people in the name of Jesus. We thank you that they reach out, Lord God. And we pray, Father God, everyone knows that they're welcome to come in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We thank you for the service. We thank you for the word, Lord God. We thank you, Father God, in the name of Jesus. There will be healings and miracles, Lord God, and lives change this day in the name of Jesus. And we bind every move of the devil to try to rob or disrupt or disturb yes. or take away from the word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Mark. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. And, you know, you look at gloomy days and... Gosh, rough times and things ahead and people and situations and everything else. Aren't you glad we serve a risen Savior? Amen. That Bible tells us in the book of Acts that death couldn't keep him in the grave. Amen. Amen. So you and I have the same promise and victory because in the end when he shouts or the angel shouts or the trumpet sounds, you and I won't be left in the grave either. Amen. 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 Well, say hello to somebody this morning if you haven't already. And those of you that are new with us, we're glad you're here, both online and here in the sanctuary. Do you know we still call it a sanctuary? Amen. And you know that's because when we come in here gathered together, it doesn't mean we have to be in this building, but wherever we are as the saints, that we have a safe place. Uh, but the devil comes to church too. Don't forget that. Amen. The devil is always working to bring negative thoughts. Uh, and when I say negative, I don't mean just like it's cloudy outside. I mean things against the gospel, things against what Christ has given us. And so we have to always be mindful that even though we may be a little sad, you may be a little down and out about something. Remember, there are well springs of living water. That Bible says it will proceed out of your belly, right? And he says he'll prepare banqueting tables in the presence of your enemies if you're walking with him and following him. And that's who we're to be in these last days. Amen? Amen. So let's turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Familiar scripture. Maybe I'll read a little bit in Acts chapter 2 as we get going here because the Bible tells us in the book of John that Jesus not only will be raised from the dead but he is the resurrection and he lives in us who believe amen, amen. excuse me us who believed us who received him us who walk with him what a great thing has happened in your life and mine that we can even walk with the Lord how many times I've talked about the lame man in the Bible and I've said we were all lame. We couldn't walk with God because of where we were, because of the lifestyle we had. So I'm going to read some of this in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 out of the NLT version, but I don't want to take away from the King James because I think some things are so much clearer there, even though uh, it's an older interpretation and so on. <clears throat> But in the uh, NLT, the New Living Translation, it says, don't let the excitement of youth cause you to forget your creator. In the King James, it says, remember now thy creator in the days of your youth. In the King James, it says, because there are evil days that haven't come as yet. That's kind of not talked about in the NLT, it kind of refers to before life becomes unpleasant because you're growing old. 
So either way you look at it here, whichever interpretation you go through, there's reason to remember the Lord now. How many of you remember just a few, two weeks ago, I believe we read in Deuteronomy, and in Deuteronomy chapter 8, the Lord said a couple times, don't forget the Lord. Amen. And so here in uh, Ecclesiastes, uh, Solomon says, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. Don't forget the Lord. In Deuteronomy, he says, unless, unless you become overtaken sort of with the imaginations of your heart, the vanity of your heart, and you begin to think that this is all because of me. I don't know if that mentality has permeated or permeated society today. Everybody thinks because we are who we are as Americans or as a society that that's why everything's going on. No, it's because of the Creator. Remember, for us, He's not only our Creator, He's our Redeemer. And He's redeemed us from the work of the Destroyer. And you may say, well, didn't God create the Destroyer? Yes, He did. Just like somebody invented electricity. But people have died from electricity. People die when they mock or attack the things of God. They're not alive. So in Acts chapter, or excuse me, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, remember now thy creator. Now. Now. Everybody here, listen. Our oldest folk here is 92 or 91, going on 92, but uh, all the rest of you are younger compared to that. And even he would say, there's those that are older than me, so I'm still in my youth to some degree as we read through all these things. So in the NLT, he says, don't forget him. Honor him in your youth before you grow old and say, life isn't pleasant anymore. So if I said to all of us who've gotten a little bit older, how have you honored the Lord in the past? Before you started saying, like it says here, I'm old and life isn't pleasant anymore. And for a lot of us, it looks like life isn't so pleasant right now with everything that's going on, no matter what age you are. But that's why the Bible tells us we always have hope in Christ. Because he overcame all of this of the world. So we understand that this isn't the end of us no matter what. I was saying to one of the men, I was at three funerals this week. It looks like death is taking things over, but death will never take everything over. Because Christ is life. God has given us life. He quickened every one of us that came into this earth. Death won't keep him down when he goes to the grave. And it didn't keep him down. And it won't keep you and I down. Because Amen. there's always life. Life in the scripture. Life in the ministry of the gospel. Life in Jesus. There's victory for us in all these things. No matter what goes on around us. Today's a gloomy day. Amen. Yesterday the sun was shining. For about an hour. <laughs> but that's not what you live for. But it Amen. does affect us in ways. So we pay attention to all these things. The, the church, the gathering of the saints, the sanctuary, a safe place where we can come together. We can rejoice. We can praise. We can remember the Lord. We can honor the Lord. What's the Bible tell us? We should honor him with the first fruit of our substance. It tells us basically we should honor him in everything that we do. Don't forget those things as we go along. While it says here in the scripture so many different things, some in the NLT, it relates to your physical being. And in, in the uh, King James, it relates to a lot of things happening in the world. So let's go ahead and read here. And in the NLT, it refers to remember him at least four, or five, six times as you go through. Uh, and then it gets down to a place where it says, remember him while you are young. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. Young people, listen, we've got young folks that grew up in church. Amen. Don't forget the Lord. Amen. 
Don't begin to say within yourself, as it says here about in Deuteronomy, that we begin to think of my own ways, I've done all this. Don't forget him. Remember him in the days of your youth while evil days come not. And a lot of us can tell you life was so much different 30 years ago. But some evil has come now. There's evil working in the world. There's a system out here that we couldn't yet see, but now you can see very plainly. Amen. While the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Listen, everybody, two years ago, you would have never said, I don't have pleasure in a lot of these things. But today you're saying, I don't have pleasure in them. But that's not a terrible thing. Rejoice in the Lord. Because in him, there's always, like the Bible says, pleasures evermore. Amen. In him, a simple gathering together. Do you remember we were talking about when you can't do all these things, it may mean families get back together. It may mean that parents uh, now have time to spend with their children because the system out here has slowed down. Children be able to get back home because it's the only place I feel safe going back to anymore. I'm not going to fly to, you know, the far corners of the world to spend my time. I got family to visit. So in that, just keep praying that those are the kind of things that happen where we are today. And even amongst the saints, people that have acted as though they don't need the body of Christ. They don't need the fellowship of the saints. They don't know they're harming their own selves. They're working against themselves. Remember in the scripture, it talks about those who oppose themselves. They don't see the value of a lot of things. How long do we have to go in some of these things before people remember what real value is? We're looking at inflation. How inflated does our economy have to be before we realize the value of money? What we tried to teach our children for so long that has gone so far out of bounds now. You're really getting the same pair of tennis shoes you and I used to get that were called Converse back in the day and were popular. They put a little mark on them here, a little more insulation in them there, and they're charging you 150 times what we paid for them. That's inflation. That's the warnings in a lot of these things about what the Lord has shown us. He says, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them, I can't enjoy them anymore. We can destroy our own physical bodies and our system. We can age along the way and so on and uh, live a lifestyle that's horrendous. And so now we get to the place where I can't enjoy what I do anyway. And I can't serve the Lord now because I can't even move about. He says, remember the Lord now. Remember to honor him now in what you have and so if we have a hyperinflation and suddenly everything you had takes everything to make it through a year and prior to that you could have been funding missions and funding ministry and funding this and funding that and now it's too late it doesn't mean be unwise about saving but it means value the right things remember and honor the lord in everything that we have while the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not, be not darkened. And we know that the Bible tells us there's a day when all those things are going to come to pass. Amen. Now, many people who have some free time could have took that one hour of sunshine yesterday and been out in the sun. Many of us, if you have jobs and things that take your time, you can't necessarily do that. But so if they love the sun and the sunshine, and they missed that one hour window yesterday, it looks like we may not see it again for a few more days. And so you relate that to our lifestyle and serving the Lord and honoring the Lord in things, you realize, I better do this now because as time goes on, I may not get the chance again. If some of you have time off from work, and you say, well, maybe I'll go and share my faith with people or, you know, go spread the gospel somewhere. And you get delayed from that. 
and then suddenly you're sort of stuck back at your job, which takes most of your hours, you've missed that window of opportunity. And he's saying in all this, Sunday morning when we gather together, Saturday morning when others gather, gather together, Friday night when others gather together to worship the Lord, make sure you avail yourself of those things because that may be your little window of opportunity to spend time with the Lord. Amen. So he says, while the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain. Things are changing, aren't they? Yeah. We're here in, what is it, in 18 states, they have record snowfalls. Uh, volcanoes are still popping up overseas in different places. The earth is shaken, all these things. We don't know how much time we have in all this. Remember him now. Young people, if you can get busy with sharing your faith and your friends and getting them to the kingdom of God now, you may be very, very blessed that you took the time to do what you did. To say, hey, you guys need to come to Jesus. You need to get right with the Lord. We need to stop doing all these things uh, and foolish type game things and so on that we do that occupy all our time when we could be doing more for the Lord. It says in verse 3, in the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble. Isn't it sad we have to lock the door and put a doorbell on there? That's what it's talking about here. The keepers of the house tremble because you're in a time that's not peaceful anymore. Amen. That means you've got to have a camera so you can see who's coming in your yard and who's walking up to the door to protect everybody in the house. Amen. That's exactly what he's saying. You have a, an alarm system, you have cameras, you have a, a, a dog that barks, whatever the case may be, because you've got to protect from all these things because you never know what it's going to be like today and tomorrow. He's saying, remember the Lord and honor the Lord in all these things before all of these changes come into full swing. The keepers of the house shall tremble. That means your mighty ones, the guards, they're even scared for their life. They know they need help. As the Bible says about when you watch over the city, if you do it without the Lord, you do it in vain. We need help. We can't fend all this off. You're hearing that in the news today. And so thank God we've got Jesus Christ the anchor of our souls, our protector, our shield and our buckler that we can always trust to, trust in, excuse me. In the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble and strong men shall bow themselves. Wow, strong men bow. In the NLT it says when their shoulders won't keep them upright anymore. Here it more or less symbolizes that they don't have the strength to defend anymore. Strong men shall bow themselves and the grinders cease. And I can remember talking about this years ago now, when things were still functioning properly. But when the grinders cease, the NLT refers to the fact that your teeth don't grind your food anymore because you don't have most of them. I think last week we talked about the tooth fairy. That if you still believe some of these things you're hearing, you might as well look for the tooth fairy at 85 years old when your teeth are falling out. Put them under your pillow and see re what rewards you get. So that's the NLT version, but in the King James version, it refers to the work stopping, the milling, the grinding. You know, they were, they were farmers. They milled the grain and the corn and everything else, when the grinders cease, there's no more production. There's no more of these things going on that you trusted in and looked to. And maybe it's our, our food source and so on. But he's saying before all those things to come to pass, make sure you honor the Lord. And how many folks have said, once I get to here, I'm going to serve the Lord. And once I make this much money, then I'll take time to do some ministry things. 
uh, the time is short now. He's saying, remember him now. While you have strength in your body, while your shoulders are upright, while there's still some laboring and things going on, where one day you say, now I'm going to go out and start something and be a success, but you can't do that now because there's nothing to do. There's no more grinding. There's no more work. He says, remember now your creator. So the grinders cease because they are few, and those that look out the windows be darkened. The NLT refers to a young woman looking out her, woman, uh, her window. Excuse me. It refers in the King James to our eyes growing dim so that we can't see out that window very far anyway. It's sort of foggy and cloudy whenever we look out. Some of you can appreciate having vision, being able to see. Some people still, my wife doesn't even wear glasses to read. That amazes me. But to have vision, to be able to see. But then when something's down the road, there are ways I have to tell her what it is. So it's a different story. So the grinders are few, and those that look out the windows be darkened. The great thing is that Christ gives us light, right? So that we can see clearly, as the Bible says, and he makes all things known to us. As long as we're mindful, as long as we're worshiping him, as long as we're honoring him, as long as we're remembering him. We don't have to fear any of that, but we do know our eyes can grow dim. We may not see like we did before in the physical realms, but you know what? There's some folks we know that can't see so good in the physical realm, but they're very keen and aware of what's going on right now in the time and the season we live. They can instruct us about things that are happening because there are things you can't see with your eyes anyway. They're spiritual things. So the keepers of the house tremble. Strong men bow themselves. Grinders cease. They're few. And those who look out the windows be darkened. And the doors shall be shut in the streets when the sound of grinding is low. Were we being warned about a time in our country when businesses and factories would close, their doors would be shut, the laboring wouldn't be going on like it used to? We seeing these things in what we experience today, and yet in all of that, we can boldly say that the Lord is our provider, God is our provider, he meets our needs. It also says, the grinding is low, and he shall rise up at the voice of the bird, and all the daughters of music shall be brought low. So the doors will be shut in the streets, the sound of grinding is low, and he shall rise up at the voice of the bird, and all the daughters of music shall be brought low. The sound of the bird. Many of us, when we were younger, we could hear the birds chirping outside. That woke us up early in the morning. Those of you that were on a farm, you'd hear the rooster crow. That's why nobody likes roosters. <laughs> now, you don't hear so well. You really have to listen to hear birds chirping. Now, you don't wake up at that rooster crowing whatsoever because your body's a little different than it used to be. You don't have that anxiousness to get up in the morning and roll out of bed. That's gone from you now. He says, before all of this, honor the Lord. So now is it too late for us? Because our eyes are a little bit dim, because we don't like getting up in the morning, because we don't hear the birds chirping or the rooster crowing and the business isn't going on. No, it's never too late for us to get up and serve the Lord, to remember he's our creator, he's our savior. Yes, he created the destroyer that's destroying a lot of things, but he's also given us the victory through Jesus Christ to overcome the destroyer. Amen? Amen. Amen. So it says, 
the music, the daughters, the music shall be brought low. How many of you remember even back when our pastor, our founder was here, and then I've talked about this numerous times, under uh, some religious decrees of religious organizations, there is no music. There is no happy sound of song. It's a bondage, a distressful thing that they oppress you with, and they won't allow any of that. And some of the folks, you hear their testimonies when they come out of those things and they talk about what a joy it was to hear about Jesus. What a great thing it was to go into a church where people were singing and happy and joyous, like all of you look right now, about loving the Lord and how God set them free and that there was hope in all of this. And you're not in bondage, you're free to serve the Lord. You're free to love and free to worship and praise. Amen. And their testimony is that's what drew me out of where I was to follow Jesus. All I know is I was in no religion like that before I knew the Lord, but when I saw the people around me in a praise and worship type thing that I had never experienced before and heard the word, I mean, I saw a difference. I knew that wasn't in me, and I was drawn to that. The grace of God, the love of God. Amen. So that the voice of the bird and all the daughters of music, the singers of music, are brought low. Verse 5 says, and when they shall be afraid of that which is high. I don't know about you, but in the last four or five presidential eras, I hear fear from everybody. That which is high, those that are in power, Amen. those who have some authority of control or they can enact laws and get people together and follow them. People are afraid of them. We're afraid of where we are right now because of what we're seeing going on in society. We don't have a fear that's an ungodly, scary, demonic fear, but a fear of Lord. Where are you in all of this? What's the results of what we're seeing right now? A reverent fear before the Lord. How's it going to affect our children? How's it going to affect our family lifestyles? How's it going to affect the preaching of the gospel? Getting the word out to the rest of these Amen. about your salvation. Also, when they shall be afraid of that which is high and fears shall be in the way. And you know, the enemy's greatest tactic is fear. Yeah. If he can make you fear things. So people who don't understand that they're being used by some of those forces, they enact fear in people. They publicize fear. They portray fear if you don't do this or don't do that. It's like I used to say all the time when you were in sales training, they would teach you how to get the people to know this is going to hurt if you don't do what I tell you. There's a fear there. It's going to hurt you. And now I'm going to give you the answer how you can get rid of the hurt. So I bring you a fear and then I bring you a way out of it. I created them both as the salesperson because you didn't really fear that. You didn't fear that if your family died or if you died and you didn't have insurance, where's my family going to be? But now I'm going to make that hurt so you understand that you need this insurance policy I'm trying to sell you. And I'm not saying it's not good to have insurance or any of those type of things, but this is the way systems work. Governments have worked the same way. They've done, done demonstrations, demonstrations. When we talk about Jesus hanging on a tree on the side road there going to the, up the road to Damascus, that was the Romans showing the people, if you rise up against us, this will be your fate. They used fear to demonstrate those things. As we've seen so many regimes in the last 2,000 years uh, do. So they shall be afraid of that which is high and fears shall be in the way. A lot of people are afraid to share their faith because 
there's been a fear put out there that if you share your faith, why we will accost you or you'll be an enemy of our governments or whatever the case may be. So fears will be in the way. And the almond tree shall not flourish. That means fruit come forth. In the NLT, it talks about uh, you will grow old and ha have gray hair. I know you can't relate to any of that. <laughs> I can't, I'm thankful. I'm growing old, I may not get gray hair, but you know what, it doesn't matter when your body's not doing what you want it to do, whether you have gray hair or not, doesn't make a bit of difference. Amen. But in the NLT, it talks about a time when you can't bear fruit, in other words, children and so on. That's what it talks about there. And when he talks about desire in the NLT, that's what he's talking about, sexual pleasures, but in the King James, your desire to get up and achieve something, your desire to go out and get something accomplished or build something or work with somebody, those desires go away. How many of you can remember when you were younger, you were game for almost everything? Somebody told you something was going on, you were going to get there. Now you think, well, it's only 40 degrees out. I put that coat on, it's a little heavy. I don't know about walking that far across that parking lot to get there. I mean, you calculate anything. Where's the nearest bathroom? What time are we going to eat? I was just sharing with somebody about a lady we took on an Israel trip who wasn't really a church lady, but she was a friend of somebody, and words never leave you. Feed me now in the back of the bus to the tour guide. Feed me now. I don't know if you all remember that movie where that giant plant was in the, in the floor store, whatever it was, what was that called? And that thing ate them people up. Feed me. Sounded just like that. Never forgot that. that gee, that was back in the 1970s. That was shortly after I was married, so. I remember my wife and marriage a lot more, though. I'm happy about that. I hope you do, too. So they were afraid of the high. Fear shall be in the way. The almond tree doesn't flourish, and the grasshopper shall be a burden. Now, again, the difference in, in this is in the King James, it means like there are pestilences, grasshoppers, eating everything, and so on. But in the in the NLT, it refers to, you used to be like a grasshopper. You hopped all over the place. Now you don't go anywhere. You don't feel like going anywhere. You might rub your legs together a little bit like the crickets do, and that's about it. <laughs> that's as far as you're going. So he's saying, before all these things happen, and I know, listen, young people, when did we ever think we were going to get older? I looked at, the, you know, I shared with you my uh, nephew passed, and so the, his cousins and sisters and brother and everybody's there, and I watched all those young people, and I thought, my goodness, they're avoiding us. We're the old people now. <laughs> Not that they're avoiding you in a terrible way, but they're the older folks, and so they don't relate to what we relate to. Hey, wait a minute, I did stuff just like you did. They don't know all that because a lot of times we don't get a chance to talk to them and tell them about what we did and what we went through and the battles we fought and the victories we won and the failures we had and everything else. Uh, I was with a young man the other day and I just started a conversation and I said, you know what, I'm just going to tell you, I never had to worry about anybody being pregnant. And I said, I never had to worry about venereal diseases. I never had to worry about a couple other things, and I went through them, and I said, do you know why I'm telling you this? <laughs> then we got in the car and drove for a while, and I said, I want you to get the moral of the story, and so I went through some things, and I said, here's the moral of the story. Again, I never had to worry about any of that, and I wasn't saved at the time. I was scared. When I saw my friends doing drugs, 
I was scared because of what I saw. And I never got into that. Scared is a good thing at certain times in your life. Fear is a good thing when it keeps you from getting in trouble, when it keeps you from destroying your life. It's a good thing. So as we were arrived at our destination, getting out of the car, I said, hey, remember the moral of the story. Amen. And I left with that. I think sometimes we need to do that. Remember what we talked about with Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal? When you stand on Mount Gerizim and pronounce the blessing, but when you're on Mount Ebal and you are pronouncing the curses, say them very loud so they will hear them and understand, don't go there. Don't defy the Lord. Amen. Don't put yourself in jeopardy. Amen. Amen. That's what it was all about. Then we went to Deuteronomy in 28 there, the 14 blessings and what was it? 53 curses afterwards. Because there's so much out here to get us in trouble and draw us away from the Lord and cause us to forget. Like he said in Deuteronomy, forget our creator, forget our redeemer, forget the one who loves us when everybody else is trying to bring you in to subjection to what they want and what they do, especially the works of darkness, right? Amen. So they'll be afraid of that which is high and fear shall be in the way. The almond tree won't flourish. The grasshopper shall be a burden. In other words, there's pestilences on the land and desire shall fail. Do you know in uh, other places of the world, when it's cloudy every day, you're told they party and drink all the time because there's nothing else that makes them rejoice. Well, and that's what he's saying here. These things will come at a point in time, and then you may lose your desire. So if you have desire to serve the Lord now, and do something aggressively for him, ask yourself, what do I have to do? Why don't I get up and do it? What am I waiting for? Because the more I wait, the harder it's going to be to do. There's going to be less activity in those realms. Although we know he's going to work what he's going to work right up till the end. Amen. And there's going to be glory in the church, he said, by Jesus Christ. His glory is going to be spread over all the earth, right? You and I have the glory of God in us along with the rest of the congregations throughout the world. His glory is being spread through all the earth right now. Amen? Amen. Amen. Everybody else alive and awake? <laughs> I know I'm going to ask you to say amen real loud or something. Amen. At least move. Remember to say it now while you still can. Before one day, yeah, your mouth barely open. You don't have much voice left anymore. That's why we love listening to our brother Cleveland over there in his 90s who still amens and we can all hear it. Amen. 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 Thanks, Cleveland. I heard you there too. So it says the, those things all happen. The grasshopper becomes a burden. Desire shall fail. Because man goeth to his long home, and the mourners go about the street. Long home represents you go to the grave. Do all this before all these things come, and you yourself or I myself or anybody out there listening, you end up in the grave. Amen. That's your long home. That's going to be your residence until whenever Christ gives that shout, and we're taken up out of the earth, and we are changed, and our mortal body puts on immortality. Of course, in the grave, it ain't going to be looking as good as it looks right now, if we look good or think we look good now. Amen. But it's going to be changed. And he says, that's your long home. Amen. And remember, even if you are raised into the kingdom... There's no more works that you can mount up to receive rewards for. 
That time has passed. Because man goeth to his long home, and the mourners go about the streets. Now they may be mourning for us. They may be mourning because of the time and the season we're living in. That's why in all of this, the Bible talks about the believer when he passes, he's free from all his labors. He's with the Lord forevermore. Amen. And I've been saying this more and more to folks as I go through this. Listen, as believers, this is what we're laboring to get to. That I kept the faith right up to the end. I know I've been saying that a couple times. I want you to get this. That you don't have to grieve me when I die, I pray. I mean, you might say, well, whatever, position, leader, or uh, just person, whatnot, and so on. You're going to miss them and all those type of things. But man, we should be rejoicing yeah. that we made it to the end. Yeah. The battle's over. We've kept the faith. Yeah. We yeah. did what Jesus required us to do. And wouldn't it be great when you get to that place and even though there's people mourning you, they can say, I don't think they could have done any more for the kingdom of God. I don't think they could have pushed any harder, prayed any more, took the gospel to other places and things, even in the midst of I know we're kind of, everything's at, in a standstill or a confused state right now out there, but always about the gospel, always about the truth, always about Jesus. Yes, shouldn't we pray at our meals and shouldn't we pray? at our gatherings, and yes, shouldn't we pray and ask the Lord to bless us as we go, or whatever the case may be, all the time. Reminding, and as Paul said so many times, I want to put you in remembrance of these things, yeah. lest you forget. Yeah. He's saying here, Solomon is saying, remember thy creator now yeah. while you can. That means if you're remembering, if you're mindful, you're going to live a lifestyle that warrants what this gospel says are our blessings and the rewards. You look at a group of people and you say, everybody will say that they're believers. They'll say that they're saved like it's now almost like everybody goes to heaven no matter what. What did their lifestyle warrant? What obedience did they fulfill toward Jesus Christ and the word of God? Did they truly believe in him? Amen. Did they believe in him enough to serve him? Like a husband and a wife who believes in marriage and serves one another in marriage and uh, provides for one another. Got to use that as an example with somebody that asked me a question down here the other day. The end, they're going, yeah. And I said, yeah, you got to serve the Lord. You can't just say, I believe in him. Your Bible tells you the devils can say that. Yeah. Somebody tells you, I believe in Jesus. That doesn't mean anything. Muslims believe in Jesus. It's just not the Jesus you and I believe in. Lord, Redeemer, Savior, yeah. rose from the dead. That's not the Jesus they're talking about. Words. We're hurt by words, but you know what? Our words justify us, he said, and our words can condemn us. Stick to the gospel, love the Lord, serve him while you can, remember him now. Don't put off like, you know, down the road again and down the road again. You know, what do they say in politics? They're always kicking the can down the road to the next administration don't kick the can and don't kick the can <laughs> without the Lord Amen. so he goes to his long home and mourners go about in the streets or the silver cord be loosed you all know some of the things about that the golden bowl be broken now we talk about a glass ceiling and different things like that or the pitcher be broken at the fountain in other words it won't hold water anymore that would say, get your water before you break it. Or the wheel broken at the cistern, which was used to pull the water up out of the cistern. Then shall dust 
return to the earth as it was. The old ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Amen. The dust shall return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto the God who gave it. Amen. How many times you've heard me say, and at some of the um, committals, the Bible is very clear, both your body and your spirit in Corinthians belong to the Lord. Amen. People will say, what do you think about cremation or burial? I will always say burial, but I cannot make anybody do anything or I'm not going to hold anything against anybody in those things. But the Bible is very clear. There were no places in Scripture where anybody burned Christian bodies and did it as unto the Lord or something like that. They buried the, burned the bones of the false prophets. And all through Scripture, Abraham on, they sought a burial place. And so just to be mindful of some of that, but everybody can uh, do as they please. But remember what I told you about that preaching this gospel, we're supposed to be showing you what you should believe. And not to say everything's up to you, whatever you want to do and so on. If we don't give you the truth out of here, then I become guilty of wherever anybody goes in any of those things. And so I'm going to try to find the truth and say it as much as I can. And I was just asked that question again also. So then shall the dust return to the earth as it was. So where did it go? To the earth. And I know some may say, well, we did this so it becomes dust. You got to go a long ways to do a lot of things with a lot of stuff. If you understand what I mean by that. Amen. The dust shall return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Amen. What do we say all the time we find in scripture? That to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord for those who believe and have received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Born again according to John 3.3. 3. Followed the Lord according to what Jesus said. Follow me and uh, take up your cross. All these things throughout the scripture. So the dust returns to the earth. That's the body going back to the grave. The spirit returns unto the God who gave it because you were born in the flesh and then spirit was put there by the Lord. Amen. So we see that he formed us in the womb, the Bible tells us in various places in scripture. We know that he said to Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. In other words, I knew who you were going to be. I knew what I called you for. Now you have to follow that because God doesn't force anybody into any of these things. Amen. Uh, now I'm thinking of things I was reading in scripture. I don't want to go into all that today about some other areas that go right along with that. So it says that the preacher said, <clears throat> vanity of vanities saith the preacher, all is vanity. And throughout these scriptures, he talked about so many things that you and I do, so many things that we esteem, so many things that are the world, and it's vanity. Because if you and I never succeed at anything the world says we have to do, or any of those type of things, but we know the Lord, we teach our children to know the Lord, we share the Lord with other people. If we possess nothing, we get to go to the kingdom of God with Christ as our Lord and Savior. Because he's not going to say how many businesses did you start. He's not going to say how successful was your business. He's not going to say how many boats did you sail in the ocean or uh, planes did you fly. He's not going to ask me how many times I went to Israel. That's not a rewardable. What's rewardable is what I've done for him in the days and the times that I've lived in this life 
having followed in obedience to know Jesus, be baptized, repent of my sins, so on, and follow the Lord. Amen? Amen. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, all is vanity. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, so it would be nice if all of us had the wisdom of God, uh, he still taught the people knowledge. He's going to talk in the end here, you remember the scripture of many books. And I'll get there, but I'll elaborate on that a little bit because so many books nowadays that you can read on the craziest things. The, the shelves are polluted with this. I may have shared this a long time ago when I was in India. Uh, I stopped at a book. Let's see, it was my second time in India because my son who was with me had gone to Sri Lanka from there. And I flew home by myself, and of course he did too. So I went while I was in the airport, and they had a bookstore. And I thought, well, gee, I'll look and see what they have on some of the local religions. I had to get out of there because there were so many books on so many perverted things and everything else. It was like a lot of you when we were in Greece and we went in the knickknack shops, and every knickknack in there had body parts. And you said, my goodness, and people would, I think I want to buy one of those. What do you want one of those for? I mean, we aren't into that kind of stuff. Get out of there. But of books, <clears throat> there's going to be so many. Do you remember before Dr. Spock's book, you punished your kids in a reasonable way, but suddenly a book came out and it was the talk of, America, that this is how this should have always been done. Well, where was he for the last 5,500 years, 5,800 years? Why wasn't he there in the beginning to instruct everybody? Because the more we go, the more books there's going to be, more craziness. And I know there are books for instruction, but so many people have gotten into these books. They don't read their Bibles that much anymore. Amen. And you hear about heaven from some guy that thought this, that, and the other. And you f hear about uh, weapons of warfare from somebody that this, that. No, it tells you all these things in your scripture. Read them more than all this other stuff. And then he goes on to talk about how laborious all the books will become. And you'll get worn out. It's like when you see those videos on what's good for your lungs, and then you see there's another video, and it's a little bit different. Another video, it's got something different. This one says you should take this. This one says you should take these two. This one says you should get up and do that, and this one says don't ever do that. You should do this. Remember a while ago, chocolate was horrible for you. Then all of a sudden, chocolate's the best thing going. It's got all these nutrients in it. Wow, we love chocolate anyway, so, and coffee was horrible, then coffee's good. How many things back and forth, and one of the greatest enemy, or greatest tactics of the enemy is confusion. God's good, God's not good. Preacher's good, preacher's not good. Church is good, church isn't good. A book on this and a book on why you shouldn't. He says all these things are going to come about in the midst of all of this. So the preacher was wise. He still taught the people knowledge. That's why I just want to be able to keep teaching you what it says in the scripture. Amen. And you may say, and I throw me in here, I know that, or why I do this or do that. If that helps, that's great. If it doesn't, just throw it out. <clears throat> Yea, he gave good heed. And that's what I'm saying to everybody. Give good heed to what's going on. How many times in the last two years I said, stop listening to mainstream media. Read some other things. Search some other avenues so yeah. you won't be deceived. You won't be led astray. They tell you, take this. Research it before you take any of it. It's like people just want to alleviate any problem or anything of, you know, I might have to deal with that. Well, if let me let me just ask you this and you've all watched the commercials on tv about these medical things that if you take this here's how it's going to protect you uh, or it'll stop your diabetes but then you listen to the music 
sweet music and in the sweet music you hear, but this could cause bleeding in your intestines. This could cause heart failure. If you see this, rush to your doctor because you're going to die. Uh, all these things. But you ran at the first thing and took it and didn't hear all that beyond the music. And you go like, oh my goodness, what have I done to myself? Remember for years they told you take Advil, not aspirin. Aspirin can cause bleeding in your stomach. Years later you find out Advil causes kidney failure. If that's it, and I'm not saying that legally, so that's just my opinion. You know, if you say something about a situation and say, this is just my opinion, legally, they can't find grounds to sue you because you're allowed to have your opinion. But if you say it out there as though it's fact and it's not fact, you become suable. So, not that you want to... I'm not a, this is not legal advice either, because I'm not a lawyer, so I can't give legal advice. But the preacher had, he was wise, and he taught the people knowledge. Yea, he gave good heed and sought out and set in order many proverbs. Many times somebody will come with a scripture and say, well, look what it says. Well, we have to be able to take that scripture and put it in light of everything else that the Lord said about that. Um, a good example, if I'm, where is that at? Uh, we may get to it. Well, it's in Corinthians. Paul said about all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. What he wasn't saying is now that I'm a Christian, I can do anything. But that's what a lot of people are taking it as. Everything is lawful. Well, abortion is lawful according to the government, but according to God, it's not lawful. So it depends where you line that lawful up and what we're talking about here. So, gave good heed. In other words, it's why I'm always paying, saying pay attention. Give heed, watch, listen to what's going on, where these things are trying to take you. When you read something and see something, you have to say, okay, I see what it says, but where are they trying to take me with this? When we pass a law for the uh, alternate lifestyle, yeah, they're going to okay it for this, but is there more down the road that they're going to try to bring it about and say, well, now, because you gave them their rights, we want our rights. When we said that concerning abortion, uh, it's not your body to do with what you want. Now you've got people concerning a vaccine that are saying, it's my body to do with what I want. Well, wait a minute. On the other end, you said that wasn't the case. We got to be in line with the scripture in everything that we do. Does that make sense? Amen. Did I confuse you there or lose you there? People who said that you cannot say, I can go ahead and kill the baby in my body because it's my body, but that baby in that body in there is a different body. Amen. It's not your body. Amen. It's a body the Bible says that God formed in the womb. Amen. Big difference. So to take heed to all these things and understand these things. And life's just going to get more and more confusing here as we go. Remember, just 15 years ago, we were a Christian nation. And then somebody came along and said, America's not a Christian nation anymore. And look at where we're at. They continued to hammer those type of things. In reality, we were not a Christian nation. We were a nation founded on biblical Christian and Judeo-Christian principles. But there were heathens here just like every other nation in the world. Amen. Right? There were unsaved people. There were people that were murderers and haters and everything else. But we were founded on godly principles. Amen. All right? There's only one nation that was created by God, and that's the nation of Israel, the people. Not necessarily exactly with the land, but the people, Israel, was created by God Amen. and then put in a land that he chose. 
So, yea, he gave good heed and sought out and set in order many proverbs. In other words, everybody, let's look at this in the full light of what the gospel says before we make a decision. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words, um, which means words that would be able to be received to bring about the picture that we're trying to show. And that which was written was upright, even words of truth. So the preacher sought to find out uh, good or acceptable words, and that which was written was upright, even the words of truth. So where would we go for the words of truth? Where we have a lot of preachers and, and, and pastors or whatever in places today, the truth is in the scriptures. The acceptable word is in the scriptures. And so I don't want to be giving you little stories and little, uh, you know, poems and things when it's the scriptures that is what gives us life, gives us hope, is the truth on how to judge things. And again, I'm going to do, a, I think I'm going to do next week, we're going to talk about living and loving lawfully. Because if you're living unlawfully before the Lord or your loving is unlawful before the Lord, then you're in deep trouble. And with that, another one of those things, well, if it's love, it can be anything and it's got to be good. And that's not true according to the scripture. According to these words that are acceptable and upright and the words of truth. Love has boundaries and restraints, and things that we have got to obey for it to be true love, pure love, God's love. Amen? Amen. Amen. So the preacher fought, or sought to find acceptable words, and that which was wit written was upright, even words of truth. The words of the wise are as goads, and as nails fastened by the masters to us or masters of assemblies which are given from one shepherd i'm suddenly forgetting what the word means there are the collections uh, the words of the wise are as goads and as nails fastened fastened by the masters of collections um, which are given from one shepherd in other words when you fasten something then in that day and time with a nail that was going to stay together. Today, we would say we use a screw because it not only goes into the wood, but it creates a barrier in there so that it can't be drawn back out as easy. You can take a hammer and it's harder to pull out, right? Amen. So you ladies knew that, right? I know some of the guys don't really either because they haven't been in like some construction things, but um, you find that even small things, if you want them to stay together, if you can use a small screw because it, how it digs into the metal instead of just pushing into the, or into the wood or metal, it stays better. That's just a fact, I think. Okay? And further by these, my son, be admonished of making many books there is no end and much study is a weariness of the flesh so the making of many books there is no end and today people are being compelled to write books more and more uh, for their success for their promotion uh, for their agendas uh, little things somebody comes up with and I saw one of the best sellers is now our Christmas traditions at our house. Uh, so you can do almost anything. A friend of mine here uh, that I just run into, you may have seen this on the local news, how fast things take off like that. His daughter made a TikTok video of things that he always says to her, why she should live in Trumbull County instead of where she's at. And it went viral. 4.5 million people have watched it, so the news picked it up. Uh, so people have 
what the Bible talks about, itching ears. They want to hear something new. Just like Paul talked about in that day and time. They're always back and forth. They want to hear something new. Because we're like bored with life, it sounds like. We get mad when the young people say they're bored. But we're almost like bored with Christianity anymore. It's not enough. Somebody got healed. Oh, well. Somebody stepped out of darkness, came into the light. They got saved. Death is no longer the grip on them anymore. They die now. They're going to heaven. Before that, they were going to hell. We don't even get excited anymore. And that sometimes isn't even the main crux to the meeting. We have become like that. Okay, you got to tell me the name of the movie again, where that plant ate the people. Little Shop of Horrors. Little Shop of Horrors, that's right. I can picture it very clearly. Anyway, we're saying, feed me. Feed me. All right, they got saved. That's nice. Oh, they got healed. Oh, okay. Feed me. Feed me. I have needs. I'm here. I hope that's not what our Christianity has come to. Amen. The true gospel this Bible talks about. That it's all about me, myself, and I, although we never would say that whatsoever. But that's how we're living. If I didn't get anything out of it, doesn't matter how many people came to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, have been delivered from darkness or going into the kingdom now. I think that's a mindset in a lot of people. That's scary. That's what's happened in America. It's scary. If we didn't care about the other nations, I'd say, man, this has really gone awry. But I believe a lot of believers still care about the underground church and the persecuted church and all those things. In fact, I think there's been uh, more of an arousal of that than there was in the past. And let me ask you this, all this hoopla about Israel. How many people would be like that if they were being persecuted because of some of those beliefs. If it wasn't a big convention that we all go to, and a big dinner, and a big this, and a big that, how would those things be? How would people stand with you? As the Bible says, who's really there when you're having your hardships? Pray that we know about them. That's why there's to be communication in the church. That's why you need the fellowship. So we know when you're suffering through some things, we can help out. We can be there for you, help be strength to you, help minister to you, whatever the case is. So there are many books, there is no end. And listen, I've said, and I'll continue saying it, one day we're going to read a book. We found Jesus' tomb. We found his body. He's there. We're going to read that probably one day. Somebody's got to come up with that because other than that, how can they disavow our belief in Christ? And they're going to do everything they can to try to disavow that. So if you're out there listening and you're an author of any type, it might be a good book to start putting together. We'll never believe it and sure won't buy it. Remember I talked about the city of Talpiot down there south of Jerusalem. They said, we found it. Here's a tomb, says Mary. This one says uh, James. This one says Joseph. There's one there where we can't figure out the name. It's got to be Jesus. A year later, they proved it didn't have anything to do with the gospel whatsoever. But it was all over the news. We think we found this tomb. We think we found his body. But it wasn't there. Amen? Because it's not here in the earth. Amen. He didn't leave a physical body here. He didn't rise just spiritually. His body was changed. He came out of that tomb. People touched him. He ate food. He walked the land. He could go about without doing any of that. And then he ascended to the Father in the presence of many people. That's the Christ we serve. That's how we know Islam's Jesus isn't like our Jesus whatsoever. Ours truly is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And when he comes, Islam and every other false god will be put away once and for all. Amen? Amen. 
So, of study, he says it'll be weariness of the flesh. Some of you can attest that even when you study for some of your final exams, and uh, I was talking about when I studied for the real estate test as a young person and then had to do it again as an older person, what I went through trying to remember all this stuff and how worn out I was afterwards and sometimes just thinking wears you down mentally and physically. And so uh, he's saying all these things, the study is weariness of the flesh. And if you take on a subject and you, you, you're trying to follow it all the way through, you're going to get weary in all of that, he's saying. So he says in verse 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. You and I fear God. If He doesn't tell us to try to be ignorant of things. He says we're to study to show ourselves approved. Amen. But in your study, don't make it like you've got to drive yourself to where you're no good to anything. Fear God. Reverence him. Remember now your creator. Fear God and keep his commandments. Keep yourself clean. Walk with the Lord. Obey the scripture. Abstain from the things he told us to abstain from. Cling to the things he tells us to cling to. Love the Lord. When you love somebody, it's so much easier to put up with their shortcomings. You know, and maybe I said this already, I was at three funerals this week. One, my nephew. Uh, another one, a, an old family friend type situation. Another one, a fellow that sort of works with me in some events and things that we do in, in the scriptural things. Um, I can get weary, but he says, keep the commandments in that. And through all of that, if I didn't know that, yes, that person was a believer for sure, it's not so grievous. This person believed and struggled through some things, had some shortcomings, but was fully loved as that person was loved. And then there's somebody else that you don't really know if they ever really knew the Lord or not, but they were loved. They laugh about some of the problem situations that went on. They laugh about some of the good things. You know, in, in our loved ones passing, we always have good things that we can remember. That's why I would say to my wife, now listen, after I pass away, don't tell anybody things that you didn't like about me. <laughs> I've heard plenty of that in my family over the years from other relatives and things. There's a term they would always use, and I'm not going to let that even come into my thought right now, but don't be like that if I pass. Tell people I loved you as much as I could. I wasn't great at anything, but I tried to do what I could. If that's all you say, I'll be relieved. And it would be great to be able to say for all of us, you know, he did so much, she did so much, she loved so much, whatever the case may be. And most of us have a lot of those things. They won't remember our shortcomings. Amen. We'll pray that they get to the kingdom real quick because we know when we get to the kingdom, we're not going to remember any of that stuff, right? Amen. So he says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. What did he say? I've shown thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee? And he told us how to walk. He says that's the whole duty of man. So it's not about accumulating a lot of stuff. It's not about being known out there for this and that. It's none of those things. It's about fearing God keeping his commandments. This is the whole duty of man, for God shall bring every work into judgment. Everything we've done. I know that word judgment is a bad word nowadays, but in reality, it's been replaced with a word called choices. Make your choices count. Those, that word choices is judgments. Because when you choose between 
two things, you've judged one to be better than the other or one to be more of what you want than the other. You've judged in all those type of things. So he says, God is going to bring every work into judgment with every secret thing. That's motives. A lot of people have been known for doing good things, but when you check their motives, you find they didn't tell anybody they got rewarded for what they did. They didn't tell anybody they really did it because it made them look good in somebody's eyes or got them some favor somewhere in all those areas. God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Amen? God is not blind to the evil that men do. God is not blind to what's going on in society today. God's not blind to where these things originated from, who's behind them, what they planned, any of those type of things. God's not led astray by any of that. Or is he deceived by any of it? He's not deceived by us when we try to cover things up. He knows all these things. And so fear God and keep his commandments. Amen? Amen. And the Lord will bless us. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 2 it is. Remember, death could not keep him. He said it is impossible that death could keep him in the grave. It's impossible for him to uh, leave us there. And you and I who have Christ alive in our lives, although we see sorrow and grief and everything else, we have rivers of living water, the Bible says, that are flowing from our bellies. Amen? Amen. So it's a good time to serve the Lord and a good time to fear God and reverence what he's done for us. So this morning... If you're listening, if you're here with us, or if you're out there listening in and you've never really committed your life to Jesus Christ, I want you to understand that every one of us who are really followers of Jesus, we've come to a place where we had to understand and acknowledge that we had done some pretty evil things. And that if we died in the state that we were in, we didn't have any right to go into the kingdom of heaven. But that's why Jesus came and died on the cross and pay, paid the price for our sins so that we could go to heaven. And he said in the book of John that he is the door and that we must come through him to enter into the kingdom. In another place, he told the disciples, I've given you the keys to the kingdom. Those keys are to open the door to the kingdom. And so that you and I can now go to be with the Lord forevermore as the scripture talks about, something we couldn't have done before. Because all men were doomed to be destroyed. But Christ intervened to save us. He didn't come to condemn us, it says. He came to save us. And so today, if you'll ask the Lord to forgive you of your sins, and you may say, I have so many. Listen, whether you have one or a million, it's still sin before God. It's still the same weight before God, and it's still forgivable before God. So ask him to forgive you this morning. Mean what you say, and ask him to come into your life and be your Lord and Savior from this day forward. Now, that doesn't mean that from today on you're not going to have uh, things that try to take you back into evil. You need to get in the church. You need to follow what he says in the scriptures. You need to be taught and follow the Lord, and your life will change, and he'll do the work. He said, repent of your sins, be baptized. And so you need to follow him in the waters of baptism also, because that's a big part of our salvation, that we're cleansed and washed, and there's a remission, a rolling away of all of our sins, and all of that, as the Bible talks about, but it also talks about our hearts being changed in that also. So this morning, if you'll ask him to forgive you, ask him to come into your life, if you'll believe him, he means trust him. Trust what he says. Trust what he tells you in the scripture. Trust your life to him. He knows far better than you do. If you can say, like I said, I've messed my life up pretty good at this point, 
If you can understand that and see that you've done the same thing, you're a prime candidate for the salvation of God. And he's there ready to help you. If we can help you, message us. We're in Cortland, Ohio. Find us, send us a note, whatever. We'll get to you and do what we can to help. So if you'll pray that this morning and believe the Lord, he'll change your life. And if you'd let us know you prayed that, we'd be more than happy uh, to hear your story. So God bless, and thanks for being with us. Amen. Amen. So let's take some time and praise the Lord this morning. Everybody.